chapter 1 in your Bibles, Romans chapter 1, verse 18. Romans 1, 18. It's good to be, good to be back. I want to say thank you to Drew Krutza for preaching in my absence last week from Daniel chapter 5. I know you were well served, and uh, I was a little envious, Drew, getting to preach that text, but uh, I'm thankful um, that you were taken care of. We're, we're going to break from Daniel for a few weeks, so I want you to be aware of that. I'm going to think in a Thanksgiving direction this morning from Romans 1, and then uh, we'll be in Genesis some for Advent, um, and then back in January we'll, be, we'll jump back into Daniel. So we'll, uh, we'll take a break from that for the next few weeks. Those, um, I think the plan's on the website, so you can pick that up if you're in the habit of uh, kind of reading and thinking about the text before I try and preach them, um, then uh, you, can, you can pick it up there. Um, I haven't heard anybody saying this. I can't imagine that somebody's not, but I haven't run across it. But, you know, the, the pilgrims came over in 1620, which means the first Thanksgiving that we all look back to is kind of starting all that off would have been harvest season of 1621. So we're 400 years since. Um, so it's just, I think that's pretty significant historically. I, I think maybe our culture is drifting from the desire to honor uh, forefathers very well. And so maybe I'm not hearing about it because we kind of have a tendency to uh, diminish, if not cancel, a lot of our, our history. I would encourage you to, to read history carefully, to kind of look at the past the way the Bible looks at the past. You know, the Bible has heroes in it, um, but there's really only one hero, so it'll, it'll tell the truth about the past, tell, tell you what's good, tell you what's not so good, and we ought to be able to do kind of both of those things faithfully, not uh, exalting the past uh, above what would be honest and true and good, um, being able to be honest about failures and all that without diminishing and canceling. There's, there's a way to celebrate a good history uh, and still be honest about failures. So the Bible kind of helps us do that. I would encourage you to think about it that way. That might not be it, but I'm wondering if nobody's talking about the 400-year anniversary because of those kind of cultural trends, but um, we don't really take our cues from the culture, do we? So uh, we can celebrate that, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. You know, um, there were a little over 100 people came over on the Mayflower, and by the end of that first winter, uh, there were less than half of those surviving. Uh, the, the worst of those losses happened in January, February, and March of 1621. Eight souls lost in January 17 in February and another dozen in March before those losses started to uh, to slow down quite a bit um, and in the in the fall they they had a harvest they needed some help if they were going to survive and the Indians really befriended them and did help them they, they didn't know about how agriculture would be here so they had some things they needed to learn and, uh, and they did so that they survived. And when they got through the harvest and God had blessed with a, a, a one enough to uh, set them up to survive another winter, they, they thought they ought to gather and celebrate. So they did that. Governor, Gov, Governor Bradford said uh, uh, he sent the, the men out to hunt for a prodigious amount of fowl. Uh, so I expect wild turkeys and duck and who knows else, who, who knows else would, would have been among that. And then about 90 Indians showed up. They killed five deer to add to the abundance. And they feasted. They celebrated um, that they had survived. It wasn't perfect, but it was good. And it ought to be remembered. And, uh, and we ought to follow their lead. And I think not only should this be a really significant Thanksgiving for us because it's the 400 year anniversary of the first one, but I think it also just uh, 2021, we ought to think a little bit about where we were two years ago and uh, we would have had a 
fairly normal Thanksgiving celebration. We would have had no idea what was coming down the pike in just a few weeks, would we? Did not have a clue. And yet, uh, uh, maybe to say we've gotten through it might be a little overstated, but we're getting through it, aren't we? And here we are all together, and the Lord has really, uh, in extraordinary ways, been very, very kind to us as a people, but more specifically to us even as a church. We've, we've had lots of people sick. It could, it could change next week, but so far uh, we've not lost a church member to this virus. It's pretty extraordinary. That would be rare, especially among churches of our size. I know of a church in Lexington that lost two staff members, including their senior pastor. Good and faithful church. So we should be, we should be really, really uh, grateful. And not only have we survived, but we're, you know, we're still together. <laughs> and there are all kinds of threats to unity in uh, the present day that we're living in. And yet here we are, um, uh, still together, still loving each other. I'm incredibly grateful. And uh, so just wanted to kind of set that up and then from Romans 1 talk to you about both the, the beauty and glory of giving thanks, but also the horror of failing to do it. Uh, Romans 1 is really underscoring the failure rather than the glory, but there's always this backside to that that I want you to see. So Romans chapter 1, verse 18, I'm going to read through verse 25. This is the word of the Lord. Let's honor it by standing together. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and the birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father, would you by the Spirit press the truth of these verses on our hearts would you produce in us hearts that are grateful for all that you have done for us, especially for all that you have done for us in Christ? Help us with this by the Spirit. And for those who are with us but don't yet know you, who are still living in the realities of these verses, Father, we pray that you would draw them to yourself in repentance and faith and you would glorify yourself by saving them uh, this we pray in Jesus name amen you can take your seat I, I want us to I want us to think about this passage of scripture with three headings this morning the, the first is the bitter fruit from this sin the sin that's at the heart of this text the, the second thing is the good fruit from avoiding this sin. And the third thing is this. I want us to think about uh, how we have even more reason to be thankful than the people Paul is describing here in these verses. So first, the bitter fruit from this sin. So what is the sin I'm talking about? Well, I think the sin that Paul is talking about here is the sin that's at the heart of all of them. It, it's, it's what starts it all. It started in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. Though they knew God, verse 21, although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking. That failure 
to honor God as God. And then if you were going to think about, okay, how would we do that? How would we honor God as God? If you're going to answer that question, it would be by giving thanks. might be the clearest, most direct way. of I'm going to honor God as God. That means I'm going to see all that he's done for me, and I'm going to express my gratitude for that and for those things. Seeing it and then expressing gratitude for it. Uh, but those that Paul is speaking of here, they, they, they have not done it. And basically, these verses are describing Gentiles. I, I think in a sense it describes all of humanity, but he's especially focused on non-Jews. And he's saying they had enough information to know God. They did know him because they could see it just as uh, Becca read as we began this service. The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of his hands day after day they pour forth speech night after night they display knowledge they communicate something of God's power and goodness and greatness there's enough data there's enough information staring in the face it's certainly been staring us in the face the last few weeks hasn't it don't remember a fall uh, that has had the color lingering like this one has Lisa and I were saying like three weeks ago, we were saying, oh, it's, it's almost over. This cold snap's going to hit, and they're all going to fall off. And even this morning, driving here at the church, it's still, I mean, we're past peak definitely, but it's still beautiful, isn't it? And some of the trees are right at peak still. It's been going on for weeks. I don't ever remember a fall lasting like this one has. And I'm thankful. That's just one little expression of the realities describing. So you see these things, you see evidence of design in nature, you know this God, and yet he's saying they've suppressed that truth, they've pressed it down, they've pushed it behind themselves, they've refused to believe it and acknowledge it and live according to it. They've not honored God as God, but rather, and not given thanks to him. From this failure, from this sin, not of commission, but of omission, the good that should have been done that was not done. There's bitter fruit that comes from it. And Romans 1 is one of the most horrible passages of Scripture in all the Bible. And all of the horror of it flows out of this failure. There is a God. The evidence for this God is absolutely unmistakable. And yet, men and women, boys and girls, push that, suppress that. They shove it down. They refuse to acknowledge it, acknowledge the God who's done it all. They don't give thanks to him. They fail to do this. We've, we've seen it the last two weeks, haven't we? I, I, I tried to preach about these things from the life of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 4 two weeks ago. There he is. You remember, he's strutting on the top of his palace. He's looking at the one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the hanging gardens and the great wall, the two of the wonders of the ancient world that he had done. And he, he's saying, is this not the great Babylon that I have created for my majesty, with my, by my might and for my glory? And God strikes him down. The Lord had put him in that position. Heaven had ruled. He didn't do that by himself, and yet, He's acting as if he did. He's glorying, basking in the glow of his own glory. He's not giving honor where honor is due. He's a million miles away from any sense of gratitude to the God who, who lends him every breath he takes. And then the next week, last Sunday, Drew preached from Daniel 5. Nebuchadnezzar's son, Belshazzar, saw his father struck down and his pride become like an animal for all that time and then restored to his kingdom and yet Belshazzar falls into the same pattern and Belshazzar does not get the mercy that Nebuchadnezzar got he fails he saw all that with his dad he fell into the same pattern the handwriting is on the wall and he dies the very night he's confronted with that sin he, he set himself up against the God who made him, the God, how does it read, in, in whose hand is your breath? 
and your ways. Your, your very breath, Belshazzar, is in my hand, and yet you refuse to recognize any of it. The sin of Nebuchadnezzar and the sin of Belshazzar is the sin of everyone. It's the sin of Adam and Eve. God had, had, had made them. They knew it. They knew him, not just through creation, but through relationship. And yet, they shoved that down. They refused to honor him, to be grateful for what they've got, rather than be contented with what they have. They grasp it more, don't they? For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. All of the trouble of this world starts right there. It continues to start right there. So what's the bitter fruit that comes from this? Well, as you walk through the text, the first thing is, is it's horrible exchanges, horrible exchanges. The, it, people make these trades. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the mortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So they make this exchange. Rather than worship the one true God, they worship the things the one true God has made. And when you fall into idolatry, the, the, at, the, at the root of it, at the heart of it, will not just be you're bound down to some idol, but at the heart of it will be self-worship. Because you can manipulate created things. You can't manipulate the creator. So it comes down to my ruling, my own life, my being, my own God. They make these horrible exchanges. And then in verse 25, you see another one. Because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. So they exchanged creator for creature. They exchanged truth for lie. And then you get another exchange in verse 26. Exchanging natural relations in verse 26. And in verse 27. So exchanging, 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 trading. We take what is good and true and beautiful and lovely and we exchange it for something cheap and pitiful and poor. But not only that, but not only is there exchange, there is even before that, even prior to that, there's this darkened heart. I made that the title of the sermon but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. There's a darkening and then an exchanging. You can see the glory of God in all that he's made, and yet refusing to see it, they're blinded. Their hearts become darkened. They don't see things the way they should. They don't see creation properly. They certainly don't see God properly, and they don't see themselves properly, and they won't see their neighbors properly. All that because... Hearts are darkened, and they're darkened as the fruit of this refusal to honor God and refusal to give thanks to Him. And then, and then finally, and this is the very heart of this passage, finally there is this wrath of God expressed. So the, the fruit of this is their hearts are darkened, and then they do these horrible exchanges, and then God responds to that by giving them over giving them over now it's not it's not just God sort of with the force of his power pushing them down a bad path it's not that rather it's God in his wrath letting them have what they want or maybe I should say letting us have what we want if you don't want me fine have it your way that's the way it works C.S. Lewis once said that there's only two kinds of people in eternity, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. And that's what's happening in Romans 1. God saying to humanity, if that's what you want, you don't want me, you want life, you want this world apart from me, here you go. I'll hand you over to it. And they keep exchanging, he keeps handing them over. We're living out these realities. We're seeing these realities all around us. All of it coming from this, this basic heart sense. There is a God, I know it, but I'm refusing to acknowledge it, refusing to honor him, refusing to express gratitude for everything that I have came from him. I'm not going to do any of that. And this bitter fruit that comes from it. And as you work on through the text, the fruit just gets more and more bitter. And, and it, it, you know, sometimes when we read our Bibles, we think, okay, Ephesians 2.1, as for you, you were dead in transgressions and sins, right? So it seems like, 
how can it get worse? How can you get more dead than dead? It, how can it get any worse than that? But Romans 1 is describing a progression, isn't it? So it's bad, and it goes from bad to worse, doesn't it? So dark hearts get darker and make even worse exchanges and get handed over in even worse ways. But you get to the end, verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, mal maliciousness. They're gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. It's a horrible list, isn't it? And a, a lot of times what we want to do is look at the preceding verses and think about one sin that's so horrible and forget about this list or at least cherry pick our way through the list and say, well, some of those are really bad. I'm so glad I've never done any of those. But could any of us say I've never done any of those? I mean, it's a broad list, isn't it? And all of it's an expression of this heart reality, a darkened heart exchanging God for what is not God, exchanging truth for what is not true. Bitter fruit. It's horrible. But, but, and it's not right in the text because that's not where Paul's going, but I want us to think together, is there good fruit that comes from avoiding this sin? And I think definitely there is. It'd be pretty good fruit just if you avoided all the repercussions of it in this chapter. But there's good, positive fruit that comes from actually seeing who God is, knowing him, honoring him, and giving thanks to him. To get to it, though, I think we need to jump ahead. So just turn way over to chapter 11 and 12. And this is not going to be exhaustive. The bitter fruit wasn't exhaustive, and the good fruit of avoiding the sin will not be exhaustive. But I want to call your attention to four, maybe five things, depending on our time. The first good fruit from avoiding the sin of not honoring God and not giving thanks to him would be clarity, clarity. There's something about giving thanks that, that clears things up in your life, that brings clarity to your life. When you give thanks to him and honor God in that way, he gets bigger. He grows in your mind's eye or in your heart's eye, and your troubles tend to shrink, and you come down to proper size, and other people are properly sized. Your, your world begins to get proportionate when you do this. So there's a couple of ways to point to this. Look at the end of chapter 11, verse 33, and Paul just exalts in the greatness and glory of God. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever and ever amen so when you fail to sin in this way you see god for who he is god grows he gets big and you see that your life is like this that everything in my life is from him it's also through him and it's to him it's for his glory god begins to be magnified and 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 in the way that you view him and see him he begins to take on proper size. Now, I don't know that we ever see him actually as enormous as he is, but he grows in our sense of his power and his goodness and his greatness, and you desperately need that. Expressing gratitude will grow that, will grow that. It also gives you a proper sense of self. So we have these hinge verses in verses 1 and 2, how we're to be transformed in view of God's mercy by the renewing of our minds in light of God's mercy, refusing to be conformed to the pattern of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our minds. That would be reaching forward to God's mercy and God's greatness, or backwards rather, and then forward to, look at verse 3, for by the grace given to me, I say to every one among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. You see God for who he is. You give thanks to him for all that he's done. You have a capacity, part of the way your mind will be renewed in that will be begin to see yourself properly. Now, there's two errors, aren't there? You could see yourself too lowly. You could have a sort of groveling sense of self that dishonors God's grace to you and his work in your life. It could be too low, but it could also be way too high, couldn't it? 
And so he says, you, you think of yourself with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now, capacity for sober judgment will relate to this thing of honoring God as God. When you honor him properly, you're, you will begin to take proper size in your mind's eye. Not too big, not too small, just about right. God's huge, you're small, you're a little one who belongs to him, right? He's strong, you're weak, you're the child, he's, he's the father. Life begins to take on a, the right proportion. So, so you have clarity and then humility and then joy, joy. And so if you look in verse 12, he says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, gives you a couple of them. So you just have joy. Or related to this may be contentedness, contentedness. Do you have joy? You're not, you, don't, you don't have a heart that's grasping all the time. When, when you're honoring God as God and you're giving thanks to him, when, when, when that's the, the kind of the structure, the realities of your heart, when that's what you're full of, then joy tends to be the fruit of that. You're not thinking about what you don't have. You're grateful for what you do have. You, you can say Psalm 23, 1 and mean it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And that could be, I shall not want because he gives me everything I need. It also could be, I shall not want as a personal affirmation. If I've got Christ as my shepherd, why in the world would I want for anything else? There's a joy that comes from that. And then, and then another good fruit is, is patience and tribulation. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation. That even when things are difficult, even when things are hard, even when my desires and purposes are being thwarted, there's still so much good. I'm, I'm breathing. I'm seeing. I'm eating. I've got a roof over my head. I've got friendship and family. There's, there's so much that God has, has given. So when you set your heart to this really God-honoring task of giving thanks, Good fruit comes from it that, that, that encourages your happiness, your confidence in God, your contentedness in his provision for you, your clarity about him and yourself and your neighbor and your world. Everything begins to come into focus as the good fruit of this. All right, then the third head and the last one. And that's this. We have, we have more reason to be thankful than the people that Paul's talking about in Romans 1. We have more reason. Because he's basically, he's rooting all of this in, in creation. He's saying the Gentiles who didn't know God, they didn't have scripture, they never have a preacher to come preach to them. All they had was the heavens declaring the glory of God. But even that was enough. To see that there's so much design here. If there's design, there has to be a designer. It's true, guys. This, this stuff still works. It, ju it just does. If there's design, there had to be a designer. And there was and is a designer. Your four-year-old knows that. It's just as clear as it can be. And if he did design, and if the design is good, then, then gratitude and honoring that one who designed it should flow, but we have more reason, don't we? We have more reason. I want to just quickly walk through kind of the logic of Romans 1 with you a little bit. So just have you, I see you with your Bibles open. So let's just look at verse 15, which is kind of the hinge linking the introduction of the letter to where we're going in the letter. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So early on, we have the gospel mentioned in the first few verses. We have it here in this hinge verse. Paul's saying, I'm eager to preach to you. I want to come to you. I haven't been able to come yet, so I'm going to write to you. But I'm eager to do this. I'm longing to do it. And you might say, well, uh, he says so at the beginning of verse 15. So let's reach forward and see what the so is about. Why is he eager? Looking forward in the text. I am under obligation, both the Greeks and the barbarians. 
So he's saying, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you because I'm under obligation. Or if you're reading King James, it's I am debtor. I'm debtor. Something about the gospel means that the moment you receive the mercy of God offered to you in Jesus Christ, the moment you receive it in repentance and faith, you are immediately obligated to every other image bearer on the face of the earth. Do you believe that? You have an obligation to every other image bearer on the face of the earth. The moment, the moment you receive the mercy of God in Jesus Christ, you're under obligation. Every one of us under obligation. Paul knew that because he knew the obligation. Then because he understood that he was obligated, then he was eager to do something about the obligation. But then also it moves forward. Verse 16 has a four at the front of it. So that's linking with verse 15. So another question, why is he eager? He's eager to preach the gospel to them because he's not ashamed. Verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why is he not ashamed? For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. He's not, you're not ashamed of what's powerful, are you? If you're strong, you're kind of proud of it more than likely. You're proud of what is strong and powerful. So he's eager because he's not ashamed. He's not ashamed because it's powerful. It's powerful, why? Because it's the righteousness of God being revealed from faith for faith. Now that's a little strange, but these two things, the power of God and the righteousness of God are woven together and God is so powerful that he is able to, by his strong right arm, redeem sinners like you and me and still be righteous. When he unpacks this in Romans chapter 3, he says, though that God can be, the, be just and the justifier of the ungodly. It takes great power to do that. And then verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed. What does that mean? How does God begin to reveal his righteousness? He reveals it first of all in his wrath. Why is God wrathful? <laughs> for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, clearly perceived since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse. So why is God in righteousness angry and wrathful? Why is that? It's because we've had enough information, enough data to know him, and we do know him, and yet we've refused to acknowledge him, to honor him, and to give thanks to him. So the expression of God's wrath against people without excuse, who are guilty really of this great divine insult, I mean, every breath I have is loaned to me by him. He created the oxygen I have to have to survive. He lets me draw each breath in him. All things hold together, Colossians 1 says. I'm literally held together by a direct order of Christ. Every moment, every beat of my heart. And every person, whether they know Christ or not, it's true of them. So that's the logic of the text, the way this text rolls. And we're running to the gospel, not all that quickly, but to the gospel. So the wrath of God is expressed uh, in, 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 uh, in revealing his righteousness, in giving them over to what they wanted. And then you have the next three chapters. The rest of chapter 1 is about God's wrath expressed in giving over the Gentiles. And then chapter 2 and 3 is his wrath expressed in, as judgment against the Jews who are guilty of sin as well. And it all comes to this fruition in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the all there means all the Jews and all the Gentiles. They're all guilty. And the all would include you and me. And yet, and yet, we don't experience the wrath of God, do we? It's being revealed, but not so much against us who are in Christ Listen to how he goes on in 3. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. All of us, all of us sinners, all of us rebels, all of us guilty of this root sin described so horribly in Romans chapter 1. And yet, and yet no longer under the wrath of God. Why? 
It's striking that Paul used that word propitiation. It's not in the New Testament all that often, but every time it is, it's incredibly significant. And what it means is that the wrath of God for our sin is propitiated or assuaged or absorbed. How is it absorbed? Because when Jesus died on the cross, he was bearing our sin and he was crushed beneath the wrath of God for our sin. The reason why I'm no longer an object of wrath is because Jesus became the object of wrath in my place. He was crushed beneath my heavy load. And so I ought to give thanks because there's food on my table and roof over my head and I ought to give thanks as as a, a person who lives in the United States for the liberties and freedoms that we know, I ought to give thanks for our history, I ought to give thanks for my family, I ought to give thanks for my job and my neighbors and all kinds of things, but all of that is, all of that is small compared to the gratitude that should mark every day of my life because he saved me because Jesus would bear the wrath I deserved because in my place condemned he stood because he paid a debt he did not owe and I owed a debt I couldn't pay do you know this is this is this your truth Have you repented and trusted Jesus? Has he changed your heart? And give thanks. Let it flow out of your heart and flow out of your mouth. Let it shape everything you do. Let it produce in you the good fruit that it will if you'll give yourself to it, if you'll allow it to shape your heart and your mind, the way you think and the way you feel. It'll produce good fruit in you. How long has it been since he saved you? It's been six weeks or six months or two years or six years or 20 or 50. Have you gotten bored with it? Has the gospel become an old hat to you? It simply mustn't. It mustn't. Every day of my life I ought to be wonderstruck that he would love me like that and that he would pay such a cost to make me his. Never get over it. Never, ever get over it in this life and in eternity. And if you, and if you don't know him, then my, my job is not just tell you about it and warn you about the wrath of God. In this life, it's hard. In the next life, it's harder. It means hell. And it's forever and ever. Don't let that happen to you. If you don't know him then turn and trust repent and believe experience all that he offers to you freely in the gospel tell him all your trouble and your sin acknowledge it admit it ask him to forgive you throw all your hope in Jesus his perfect life his his death for sinners on the cross his resurrection from the grave you'll find new life there it's the only place you will find new life Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we, we're shocked at the reality of human sin, how in the face of such clear evidence, we can suppress the truth and unrighteousness, how we have done it, how we've refused to express our gratitude. But we're also amazed that you would love us like this. You would send your only son, not spare him, but give him up for us all. Lord, would you rejoice our hearts in the gospel, in this good news. Christ has died for sinners. That Christ died for sins once for all the righteous for the unrighteous to bring you to god so lord may we give thanks for this most precious gift and would you help those who don't know you to be brought today even in these moments together to turn and trust with all their hearts we pray in jesus name amen